So last section I want to go through is, uh, is when we talk about platforms. So we've had a lot of discussion uh, that's been going on today, and there's been a lot of uh, talk around as far as hardware. And one of the things that, as Biad and Jeff had mentioned around, when we talk about the enterprise space, the, dry, the motivations for why customers want to look at NFV are uh, a little bit different than what they are in service provider. And one of those uh, cases is saying is that, you know, if I've got um, X number of remote sites and I have a certain amount of hardware device, I want to be able to shrink that down. There's a support cost associated with that. There's maintaining the amount of, uh, of, of physical instances. simply just requires a certain amount of effort. One customer that we worked at earlier had around 1,000 retail branches. Um, they were definitely on the high side of what I would say revenue, what you normally see in the retail model. And they had five five network elements where they had physical devices for, I think, two separate server applications. Because of their revenue model, they, they did everything HA, duplicate, you know, uh, dual WAN, everything was duplicated hardware-wise. And um, the ops director had, had, had told me is that they have roughly every six to nine months, they have one to one and a half full-time equivalent that are doing nothing but refresh activities or something related to refresh. They've got five devices that are made by three vendors, and then another, you know, compute platform, you know, fourth one. They all have different life cycles in terms of how long they last. They were all purchased at different time intervals, so relative in there. So at any given time, you've got one and one and a half guys that are doing nothing but, okay, what's the next version that's coming out? It's part of my license contract. How do I do the upgrade? Is it a physical piece of hardware? Do I have to swap it out? If I have to swap it out, is there any connectivity issue into, you know, in terms of how I have to reintegrate it again? And that's a lot. I mean, I thought about it for a second. That one and a half full-time equivalent for three quarters of a year, I mean, that's a lot of money. Right? So, so that's part of the model we want to try to do. So when we start looking at selecting platforms for this, one of the things we don't want to do is do something where we inherently break that model, right? Because if you wind up having to put a piece of hardware out there where maybe you can save $800 or $1,200 of CapEx on, but you have a scenario where you have a higher fault rate. I mean, even if you make it fault tolerant in HA, at some point you have a fault hard drive, somebody's got to go out there and replace it. So we looked at sort of what you think about what are those ideas that why you want to be able to have a platform that to it properly enables the services to keep your doors open, right? It's got to be reliable, it's got to be scalable, it's got to be able to grow, you can't fork with everything. Um, it's got to be secure, right? You inherently don't want to create, you know, vulnerabilities by introducing the platform. You have to have strong support, right? Something goes wrong, you've got to be able to pick up the phone and call somebody. Um, weirdest thing, sorry on that, is that um, we had a product some, uh, for you, we launched a few years ago uh, called AppNav, it was a physical uh, hardware device, and we had a scenario with one customer where the, uh, whenever you connected it, that device to a switch that was made by uh, a specific uh, silicon vendor in it, every very infrequent time you all of a sudden start to get frame errors. And after a month of diagnosis, we went in, literally the problem was some corruption happening at the file layer. And uh, after we had done this, the, the engineer and I were working on this, we had sort of laughed and said, wow, can you imagine, you know, somebody like CVS who bought a bunch of servers, right, and had this problem, I mean, who would you call? And if you called, would they even bother listening to you, right? I mean, we, we spent too much time talking with Broadcom and such, and, you know, between them and Marvell, and, you know, pointing fingers, and we buy massive amounts of, you know, stuff from these. Um, you think about an individual customer, what kind of support they would have with that. Expandable. Well, so once it's out there, you want to make sure that you can do things like deploy it across multiple different types of footprints. Uh, form factor. Again, a difference between the branch and the data center. A lot of times out there, when you go out, you'll see uh, customers have um, very, very different constraints um, at remote offices, um, sometimes not even environmentally controlled, um, either, uh, either density or, or, or depth or amount of RU space is very, very tight. So you have to be able to fit something inside that type of form. You have to have options to fit within those form factors. Long life cycle. Same thing with errors, right? If you, if you say, well, I can go in here and I can save $1,500 of CapEx, but I also, have, I also turn it twice, you know, the life cycle now to what I was doing before, well, that's now eight, seven, eight hundred dollars $800 a truck roll times X number of times that you have to go out there and replace it. So you want to make sure you don't promote that at all. And then programmable, right? The other thing we've been talking about largely is how to automate. So every, whatever we want to put in place, we want to make sure that it either further enables or certainly doesn't block in any way that we want to enable our programmability. So the first piece of hardware we decided to, to use this with was, uh, was our UCS 220M4 um, because it addressed a lot of these types of requirements. Um, number one, it had, um, has the ability for dual sockets um, in it where you can run from four to 18 cores per socket. So at, uh, at 36 uh, cores or 76 virtual CPUs, most branches can be solved by, you know, with that amount of capacity. It's one RU, uh, has a good amount of storage, uh, memory up to, I think it's three quarters of a terabyte, uh, and up to eight terabyte even at, uh, at a high rate at rate 10. And actually I think that's 
going to be doubled. I think they're actually qualifying eight, give, uh, eight terabyte drives. Uh, on board, just two gigabit Ethernet ports, but also dual uh, PCI interfaces for either quad kind of uh, additional port density or doing uh, 10 gigabit Ethernet. Right, so now a good, uh, good amount of expandability. And then for all of our server hardware platforms, we, use, uh, our, we have our Cisco uh, integrated management controller for doing uh, out-of-band uh, light-down management. Now, the other side of the platform that we'll come out with is when we run on the UCSE compute plate. And this is sort of an interesting scenario because as, as I've sort of addressed, I said, you know, when I look at the requirements to run a successful and have a successful NFV platform, the, the 4000 series with the compute plate really almost matches it, I mean, ideally. I mean, almost, almost identical. And I'll, and I'll tell you why. And before I do, <laughs> I, I'd love to be able to stand here and tell you that five years ago we had this beautiful vision and the platform was built with this idea and this architecture in mind, and it just all unraveled uh, exactly that way. Although the 4K certainly does have a amount of virtualization native in it, um, a lot of the rest of it that I'm going to describe to you in a minute was just a very happy, <laughs> a happy coincidence that it happened to work out that way. But the 4000 series itself, as far as being reliable, so we've got a platform that's been um, you know, many, many generations now. I mean, the ISR series that are out is with eight or nine million devices that are out in the field right now. Um, some of those devices are well beyond even eight years in terms of how long they've been out. Uh, the life cycle side of it, even at normal pace, we're talking about a five to seven year life cycle. Um, it already has an internal virtualization framework as well as how the framework has been built for running virt services on the compute plate. Several options on the compute plate, everything from four, six, or eight cores, depending on uh, the slot density you want to be able to use. Um, support. It's, it's supported fully, obviously, by our platform with Intact, but also it's, it's not additional hardware support cost. Right? Everything we do in this one platform is managed by one side, or as one uh, support cost. And then there's one piece of native services, right, that when we would implement this as an NFV platform, there's some things that we would run just natively in, I, in iOS XE on the ISR, decoupled from what, uh, from what then runs on the compute plate. I'm going to show you in a minute why that's important. So when we look at this why, this now some, because, like I said, a, a very sort of ideal scenario. We have expandability and flexibility that we have um, external slots, modular, OIR support, where you can put things, everything from internal storage or external storage capability if you're using the internal uh, virtualization slide um, or even a, a dedicated x86 compute. If you need to have things like uh, additional Ethernet port capacity or doing PoE, PoE Plus to drive other switches, access points, IP phones. And then if you've got some legacy time support, right? I mean, one of the things we also have found, um, surprisingly at some level, is the amount of... Um, uh, customers that say that they still look forward out the next five years and they don't see any, you know, any uh, um, removing of their, uh, of their T's, their T circuits, T1, E1 circuits. Uh, not to mention those that are still running unified communications. Um, matter of fact, one, um, one customer that has uh, a rather dense amount of, uh, of XSO, FXO ports for doing uh, analog trunks, and his statement was that we will have those analog trunks there for survivable remote capability until such time that AT&T literally shuts the, you know, turns the lights off on the pots on the PSDN. So, uh, sort, of a, sort of a scenario for how long they think that uh, those those types of things are going to last. Next slide is then when we implement the SD WAN side, we can implement the SD WAN side then natively in the first part of the chassis without before it even gets to the compute platform. Now, there's one important sort of difference because when we get to that point now, it's going to tell us now that we can actually get there without having to um, deal with the encryption or labeling. Uh, before we have to go manage the hypervisor, and I'll show you why that's important, what we referenced a bit earlier. Afterwards, then, now we can run the compute plate where we run our orchestrated software on. But now, most importantly, is that, is that our OEM backend, ESA, um, and Prime also now manages everything. So now it gets managed as one platform. Right? So uh, iOS XE within the 4000 series itself has a PMP client, so it can be automated, turn up. The config templates will also work the same way. That configuration gets pushed down. The iWEN app that runs on top of EPKM then can uh, configure um, that guy as easily as it will the virtual machine that runs on the, uh, on the compute plate. This is what I was mentioning earlier about where you have that little quandrum where you have this difference between uh, the data center and the branch. So where we would come in, whether that would be GetVPN or however we're connecting to the, to the carrier or MPLS label, we come into it and we now terminate that inside the ISR itself. So now by the time we get to the UCSE compute plate, we've got the same scenario as we would have in the data center. We have just straight IP. So now we can go in there and we can manage the hypervisor, we can manage the turnover of services without ever impacting the transport. So that means we can go down there and we can basically now burn that guy all the way down to BIOS or firmware without ever losing transport connectivity. Right? And that's, that gets to be a little bit of a catch-22 
if your if your tunnel termination goes inside of a VM and you need to wipe that that server hardware all the way down to bare metal. So this is a nice little piece of advantage that way. The other side is because of the architecture of how this works is that this goes through what we call the multi-gigabit fabric. So if we have a WAN side services, like one of the things our customers tell us a lot about they like to do is to run a Windows server on there for doing software control uh, distribution. If you pull that through, right, that data, um, you go in here, I'm going to pull, you know, software packages out. We can pull that down on almost line rate going through that NIM module slot or through the external uh, e port on the, uh, on the UCS e card. And then none of that is impacting the forwarding plane. So now any traffic, any communication that's going forth to the virtualization environment, to a client, anything that's going out through the router, out through the SD-WAN uh, case, none of that gets impacted by that massive amount of traffic that's being pulled to the LAN side. Right? If you're doing that in a pure virtualization model, you need to do something if you're not having, uh, if you're doing for any amount of uh, resources that are uh, being scheduled or shared, you'd have to do something like traffic shaping some way to prevent you know, an overload uh, of, uh, of, a, of an application pulling, uh, you know, pulling packets. Does that, does that make sense as far as explaining how that, uh, how that works? All right, last thing I want to kind of leave you with when we talked about now about the different types of uh, areas where, you know, we certainly do a lot of things in software. We certainly will leverage that type of software model. But where it's applicable, certainly want to leverage abilities where we have, quite frankly, a lot of experience in areas where we've built hardware. And so when I was recently out at an um, event uh, at Cisco Live, uh, a colleague of mine uh, had uh, uh, shared this with me and uh, reminded me. Uh, when uh, Steve Jobs gave his keynote, uh, when they first introduced the iPhone, he quoted uh, a, a computer scientist named Alan Key. And basically what he said is that people who are serious about software should build their own hardware. And the reason being is in the case of the iPhone is that there was such an intrinsic match, right? Everything that went in from when they moved Mac OS into what they conventionally called iOS uh, that ran on the iPhone and all the things that they did because now I know what that environment is. And so when you look back and say, well, we now know that we've got some specific piece of hardware that we can do things like SRIOV, or I have a 4K platform where I can terminate that transport in place, and now I can know that I have unabated connectivity in between the management console and an x86 compute. These are the reasons why we say, you know what, these are advantages that we can help bring to the market based on our experience, things that we know in the branch environment by putting these platforms out for the last 20 years.